morning, everybody. No, sorry. So good morning, everybody. Today is uh, the last day of the school, and uh, we have uh, Marnik Bergs from uh, EPFL, uh, who will uh, speak about the AIDA uh, computing platform. So is, uh, he will give a lecture high throughput computing with the AIDA platform. Uh, before starting, let me just say a few things. Uh, today, the schedule is uh, slightly different from uh, the usual because uh, the theoretical part of the lecture will last uh, approximately half an hour so that you will have more time um, spent on the hands on. We will have uh, the, the coffee break as usual um, and at a certain point in the middle of the hands on, and Marnik will, uh, uh, will, um, will tell us uh, when, uh, when uh, we will interrupt. And uh, regarding the questions, uh, as usual, uh, wait uh, until the end of the lecture before uh, writing on Zoom or asking questions. So when Marnik finishes to speak, uh, you, can, uh, you are welcome to write all questions on Slack. And you can also raise your hand. Uh, maybe we will have time for one, two questions on voice. And, uh, and of course, we will post your questions from uh, YouTube, the YouTube stream. So that's all. Uh, please, Marnik. Thank you, Ivan. So as Ivan mentioned, I'm going to keep my presentation a bit short, just about half an hour, uh, because I think it's better to learn AIDA by, by starting to use it. Um, but I still want to give a bit of an overview of what problems AIDA tries to solve and, and how it solves them. And as well, talk a bit about Materials Cloud, the dissemination platform that we are maintaining at EPFL. And so uh, I do quite a bit of uh, high throughput work um, in, in, in my typical scientific work at EPFL. And when doing this, I face a number of challenges. Uh, when we want to run and to build a database of, of, of properties for a whole range of structures, we, of course, want to run a certain workflow for all of these different structures to obtain the property that we're interested in. And this workflow is basically a recipe of different steps, different calculations that you need to execute in order to obtain this result. And so I want to have a tool that allows me to automate this workflow process in a way that's robust and scalable so that I can run thousands of uh, workflows simultaneously. And ideally, I would also like to have some error handling features so in case one step in my workflow goes wrong, I can fix it on the fly and not have my entire workflow break. Another aspect very important in high throughput computing is data management. That basically when I'm running these calculations, I want all the data that's, run, that, that's generated by my workflows to be stored reliably and efficiently. And I want to be able to share this data with other researchers or collaborators in a way that they can also use it easily and find the results that they are looking for. So be able to query this database. And finally, a very important concept also in science in general is that of reproducibility. If I have obtained a certain result and I've published it, um, I want other, other researchers to be able to reproduce my result easily by seeing how exactly I've executed my workflows. And so for in order to do this, we store what's called the provenance or the full history of the calculation. And so the tool that we have been developing in order to deal with these computational challenges is AIDA which is exactly a computational science infrastructure for running these types of high throughput workflows while keeping full track of the provenance. And so GIE has completely implemented in Python and is an open source code published under the MIT license available on GitHub. And so the main features are this scalable workflow engine that allows you to um, run thousands of workflows simultaneously. Um, by having a powerful engine that basically uh, moves your calculations to the, the remote computer runs them there, checks if they're finished, and then retrieves the result and parses uh, the files that, in order to obtain the actual data that you're interested in. There's already support for many different um, types of high performance computing resources um, with different schedulers implemented. Um, as I've already mentioned, it keeps track of the provenance, so the complete history of your calculations uh, in an automated fashion. And finally, it also has a flexible plugin system. So of course, today's tutorial will be mainly about using Qantas, the Quantum Vessel plugin for AIDA, but there's already a lot of support for other codes as well in AIDA because AIDA offers this flexible plugin system that allows people to basically extend the code to run for different types of, of quantum computing codes or uh, computational science codes in general. And so I've talked already quite a bit about this concept of provenance. So let me give some more detail on, on what I mean here. So, 
if you can represent, let's say, one of the calculations inside your workflow as a node here, you can imagine that, that there will be certain inputs that are need to be provided for this calculation to run. If you're running a calculation, a pw.x calculation in Quantum Espresso, you need to provide a structure, you need to provide uh, input parameters, and so forth. And so all of these inputs are also represented as nodes in the IDA database. And so all of these nodes are then linked as inputs to our calculation. And similarly, when you have certain outputs, for example, if you've run a VC relax calculation, you might have a final structure, uh, you might have some data on the magnetization of, of, of your material. These are again stored as nodes in the IDA database and again linked to your calculation that you have run inside your workflow. And so once you start, you know. Uh, using a calculation as results to run another calculation. For example, you might have run your structure, optimize the geometry, you get a relaxed structure, and then you want to do another calculation. Of course, if you start doing this over time, you will build quite complex provenance graphs or directed acyclic graphs, as we call them. And so once you start calculating something more, more, more extensive and more complex properties, such as, for example, here is an, uh, you have the molecular dynamic study of lithium in a salt electrolyte. These problems start graphs start to become quite complex, uh, and we, so we want these to be stored automatically, and we want to be able to store this data automatically as well as it's created inside our database and repository. And below here, you can see also the image I used for my title slide. This is actually a, a representation of a database of one of our collaborators with over a million nodes, and each of the lines you can see is, is one of these connections inside the problems graph. So this is definitely a very important concept when it comes to using AIDA. Of course, what AIDA aims to do is to uh, comp compute complex properties. Uh, and for this, we want to offer and, and also offer tools for you to make these complex workflows, uh, which require several steps in order to obtain a certain property, such as, for example, the band structure. And then, of course, in combination with the provenance, we want to be able to store this entire tree, this entire co collection of calculations automatically, so you can have a proper log of what happened in the past. And others can look at exactly how your calculations were executed and also reproduce them more easily. And of course, we want to be able to store these workflows and share them with others so they can also run them. And so that way we can provide what we call turnkey workflows that are easy to use for users where you just to plug in some basic inputs and get started running these workflows in AIDA. And so as an example here, you can see one of the workflows you'll be running in the tutorial today, the bands, bands work chain, which as you might uh, expect, calculates the band structure for an input structure that you provide. And so the nice part about these workflows is that it allows us to encode the knowledge of, of scientists in this kind of workflow. For example, this work chain was already written by one of my uh, previous collaborators, and now I'm using it so I, I can rely on his knowledge and how to calculate a specific property. And I can also, of course, improve upon it. If I see a certain aspect of this work chain is perhaps inefficient or less robust, I can make changes. And so by working together on these workflows, we can uh, build a comprehensive set of workflows that are very robust and efficient for calculating the properties instead. Now, as we define um, inputs on what we call the spec of such a work chain, it automatically we can tells us, um, or we can automatically specify what kind of input nodes we expect. For example, for the structure, we have a specific type data type that's stored in the database, which is a structured data type. You also typically provide a help file, and then we have tools that you can basically automatically, if you have defined your work chain, um, see what inputs are required, which is then easy for users uh, to, to start running these work chains. We also want our work chains to be modular. For example, inside of this band structure work chain, you also have the opportunity to calculate uh, the geometry, so optimize the geometry of the structure that you provide. And this is then actually done by a different work chain called the PW Relax work chain. So because these work chains are modular, you can basically plug them into higher level work chains in such a way build uh, very complex work chains for calculating all sorts of properties. There's also other features such as input validation. So you can automatically check if the user has provided the right type of node or input for a certain uh, sort of variable. And then there's also features like error handling and protocols. And on these two, so for the error recovery, basically what we have implemented is this basic building block for your work chains, a small work chain that wraps your calculation. And so that basically checks if your calculation has finished successfully at the end. If it hasn't, it tries to see what went wrong and tries to handle these errors uh, on the fly. If it can't handle the error at all, it will still try to just restart one last time, 
because maybe you had a node failure on the cluster. And so in this case, at least you can see if that, that fixes the problem uh, instead of just handling the problem by fixing the inputs. Um, we also have over the last year been working hard on, on making these work chains easier to use by developing uh, protocols. These are basically a default set of computational parameters um, built from a test set of about a few hundred structures that offer a reasonable precision for most of these structures. And so in this way, you can simply load the work chain that you want to run, simply provide the code that you want to run, the structure you want to run, and then specify a protocol and submit it to the AIDA engine. And this is a much easier way of starting to run these work chains. And this is exactly what we will be doing um, during today's tutorial. Now, building upon all of this, um, our, our team has also been working on uh, uh, doing these simulations in the cloud using AIDA Lab, which is basically um, a Jupyter Lab based uh, framework where we have developed a graphical user interface for people to start running these simulations. So this is very handy, for example, for non-expert users when they want to start running um, advanced search calculations for a certain structure, they can simply either upload this or, or select it from a database and then specify what they want to run and then automatically these simulations will be running uh, in the cloud and then provide you with, with, with um, the, the result in the end. This is also what we're using today, but we'll be mainly using the terminal because of course you all have experience with uh, Quantum Espresso on a lower level and we want to be able to show you how AIDA works in more detail. Uh, as I've already mentioned, AIDA is quite extensible in, by using uh, plugins. Uh, and so uh, we already have quite a big selection of plugins available. Over 50 plugin packages have already been registered on the AIDA plugin registry. And so that, that offers uh, support for almost uh, 100 different codes within the computational science community. And so we're happy to see that um, the contributions from the community are steadily increasing. And uh, so our community is growing beyond just our development team. And of course, we definitely welcome um, any more contributions in this regard so we can have AIDA run for as many codes as possible. And something we've also been working on recently, and I've actually submitted a paper for um, just, just for a few weeks ago, um, is this concept of common workflow interfaces. So um, typically, if you write a workflow in AIDA, you will do so for a specific plugin, so for a specific code like Quantum Espresso. And you cannot simply transfer this, this workflow easily um, to other, other codes at this point. And so what the goal of this project was to, to make sure that we can actually have a common workflow interface. So if you want to run, for example, an equation of state calculation or workflow for a certain structure with a certain protocol, you can then simply specify one of the codes that are currently supported, which is 11 quantum codes inside this common workflow project, and then we easily run the same equation of state work chain for all these different codes. So for example, here you can see the equation of state for um, nine different codes that support periodic boundary conditions. And so this is a very useful tool in order to cross-validate these different codes and see if they actually obtain the same results when running for the same uh, structure and the same type of property. Another important aspect of um, research in general is, of course, sharing your data. And AIDA makes this quite easy because you can simply export either your entire database or a uh, part of the database as an AIDA archive that can in turn be shared on an online repository. So you can either plug this into any kind of online repository that allows you to share this data. But we've also provided a dissemination platform called Materials Cloud, where you can, on the one hand, store all of your archives, but it also offers more features. So you can think of AIDA as sort of the engine for running our workflows and doing our scientific work, and Materials Cloud as the dissemination platform for sharing our work or other tools that we have been developing. And so there's five elements to Materials Cloud, uh, archive, learn, explore, work, and discover. So let me quickly um, go over these different aspects of Materials Cloud so you can see if maybe some of these tools are useful to you as well. So for Materials Cloud Learn section, as you might expect, this is an educational platform where you can find tutorials. Um, you can also find presentations on, on certain concepts in doing computational science. So you can also, for example, if you still haven't had enough of Quantum Espresso, uh, you can find some old schools here as well that were presented uh, some time ago. So all of these are collected on this educational platform for people to use and develop their skills as computational scientists. 
We also have the Materials Cloud Work section where you can find uh, all sorts of tools to basically get started with doing calculations. Um, for example, here you can find a bunch of tools. Um, and one example that may be interesting to people of this cool is the Quantum Espresso, Espresso Input Generator. Here you can basically upload a certain crystal structure that you want to run, specify, for example, a pseudo potential library you want to use, what kind of structure it is, and it will automatically generate an input file for you to run with Quantum Espresso. Other tools that are offered here are the Quantum Mobile Virtual Machine, which is um, similar to the virtual machine you've been using for the school. It offers um, a basically computational science environment with AIDA pre-installed and other codes such as for Quantum Espresso, but also Yambo, Fleur, Siesta, um, basically, most of the codes that are available through the common workflows interface uh, are also available in the quantum mobile. Then we also have AIDA Lab, which I've already mentioned, and the AIDA Registry, which are all posted on the Material Cloud work sections. Then there is the archive section. So here you can upload uh, data that you've um, obtained for running workflows or just calculations in general. Um, you can share your data here and it will automatically assign a DUI so others can also cite your data and your data will be guaranteed to be online for at least 10 years after you have deposited it on the materials cloud archive. And if you've run your calculations using AIDA, you will also be able to add these direct links to discover and explore sections for your data set. And so for the discover section, this is basically you can uh, sort of interface where you can for your materials of interest define certain properties that they are, are easily visible and are discoverable by people that want to uh, analyze you know, your data set. And then there's also the explore section where, well, this will also be using today's tutorial, where you can basically start exploring the provenance graph um, of the calculations you've been running. So you can start, for example, a certain band structure, it will visualize it automatically. Then you can have a look at the calculation that ran this band structure. You can still at the input file, which should be quite familiar to you by now. Also look at the output file, et cetera, and then you can continue exploring the provenance gap. For example, you can have a look at um, the structure data you want to, that actually was used. So the structure that was run in this calculation, again, there's a visualizer for this. And then you can also, for example, uh, download this. So you basically it offers a way for you to explore your data sets uh, and, and the full provenance uh, interactively. And so as I mentioned, I want to keep these presentation a bit shorter because I think the best way to learn is just to get started with AIDA. So let me give a bit of an overview of, of, of today's tutorial before we get started. Of course, the first step is to make sure that you can log into the Jupyter Hub cluster. Um, the link is here. It's also in the Slack and you should receive it by email. So hopefully everyone has been able to log in. If not, be sure to let me know and then I can help you out. When you go to this link, you will see um, this sign in box and there's still this erroneous message, uh, which is a little quirk from the uh, authentication system. So Feel free to just ignore that, plug in uh, your username and password of choice, and then it should open this Jupyter Hub um, AIDA Lab interface that you can then use to get started with the tutorial. Be sure to make a note again of your username and password. So um, in case you get logged out at some point, you can still log in because we can, of course, just boot up a new server for you, but it's possible that you can lose some data. Uh, in this uh, AIDA lab interface, you can on the one hand open a file manager so you can look at the files that you have created during the tutorial. This may be handy for opening, for example, a provenance graph that you have generated or the band structure plot at the end of the band structure work chain. And may, most of the work will be done inside of a terminal so you can open a terminal. This will open a simply another tab inside your browser. You can of course also open multiple terminals. And this is where most of the, 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 the tutorial material will be running. We'll start the tutorial by just running a simple PW calculation through AIDA. And by doing this, we will learn on the one hand how to import a structure in your database and provide some input for this calculation. We'll learn how to install pseudos with the AIDA pseudo package, um, setting up your code so it can also be stored in the database of AIDA and provided as an input for the calculation. And of course, also how to specify your input parameters and k-point message you want to use for your PW calculation. Once the calculation is finished, which shouldn't take too much time, um, we'll show how to generate a provenance graph and also analyze the outputs of the calculation using the Verdly command line interface that AIDA provides. Next, we'll move to uh, running workflows, which is, of course, the purpose of using AIDA. And here we'll be using the protocol that I've already talked about before to quickly run a band structure work chain for silicon. And so once, once this work chain is running, you can basically analyze and see how, how it is evolving 
as it is completing. In the end, you'll be able to plot the band structure of silicon. And while it's running, we will also show you how to explore the provenance graph that's being generated by the work chain on the materials cloud explore sections. And finally, if time permitting, um, we will also learn you how to manage and query your data. And of course, as you start running more and more work chains uh, to calculate properties for the structure that you're interested in, you will be having uh, larger and larger data sets. So we'll import a little data set that was already run a few years ago, and it'll show you how you can organize your data into groups. So you can imagine this as being folders with, with subfolders, so you can more easily find the data that you're looking for. And then we'll also show you how to query your database. So we'll, we'll show you how to use a tool called the Query Builder, which builds a query based on the connections inside the provenance graph. So you can find the results that you're interested in and plot them to do this sort of high throughput analysis. All right, so all that's left for you to do is to, of course, thank the Materials Cloud and AIDA teams at EPFL in Europe and beyond. And the uh, funding organizations, first and foremost, of course, the MAX, projects uh, and Marvel projects for, for providing all the resources needed for us to develop AIDA. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, we'll now move to answering some questions. And then once we are, you know, everyone has been successfully informed, we can move to the actual hands-on immediately and get started with using AIDA. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so I see that I don't see questions uh, in the YouTube stream. So if uh, someone of the participants want to ask, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, you, you can speak, or uh, also you can write on Zoom or on Slack. So let's wait a few moments, whether there are questions, you can raise your hand if you want. Okay, so apparently, apparently everything was clear, but maybe more questions will come uh, when they will try it uh, for the end zone. So yes, I guess we can proceed to, with, uh, with the end zone now. Ah, I see a raised hand. Oh, yes, yes. Uh... Hello. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the presentation. So uh, I have a very general question about the uh, data because whenever uh, whenever we upload the data, there are like, there are like lots of data. So first question is that uh, in Ada, do you I mean care something about like duplication of data that if you are uh, upload like two times of data or someone uh, upload the same calculation which I I have uploaded? So in current stage, uh, are you taking care about this duplication or not? So um, I, I, as far as I know, on the materials cloud archive, if you upload your data set, it doesn't try to cross-reference with other data sets to see if there are similar data or similar calculations. So in this sense, there will be some duplication on the materials cloud. But uh, this is also quite curated. So typically, it will be a data, data set that you have for a certain publication. And so it wouldn't just be a, a random collection of a lot of calculations. But there is indeed, I, I, as far as I know, I'm, I'm not one of the materials cloud developers, but I don't think there's a, a way of, of basically checking if certain calculations have already been run inside an other archive that is hosted on site, uh, the, the materials cloud. Uh, okay. There is and one second... thing though that, that it, it, oh, sorry, just a yeah, thing. Go, go, go. inside AIDA, we do have uh, features inside your own database um, to use caching, for example. So if you've already run a certain calculation with certain inputs, there are caching features available that won't, so you don't have to rerun that calculation. Uh, this is only, of course, if the inputs are exactly the same. Right? Mm, okay. But this is inside yeah. one database, so not on the on all materials plan. No, not on the all of them. Okay, okay. And second question is that you mentioned that you are, you upload like some of the metadata, right? Yes. Uh, when we upload, like it doesn't uh, upload like entire calculation, but just some metadata from that uh, so, calculation. Uh, if you if you upload well. On the materials cloud, you can upload the data that you choose, right? Um, it doesn't specifically have to be run through AIDA. But mm -hmm. if you have run your calculation through AIDA, what AIDA will store in the database and its repository will depend on what's defined for these specific calculations. For, for quantum specific, for example, it will store um, metadata in the sense of, of, of information about 
this this this, this calculation job and uh, information is important for AIDA. But it will also store, of course, the input output files, uh, not all of them. For example, you can imagine if you don't want to store all of the charge densities inside the repository, because then your repository will go quite big. Or for example, wave function files, this will, this will quickly blow up your database into a very large size. But typically the input file and output file will be stored. Um, and it will also parse the output files and store certain outputs as node inside the database. So there will be a lot of information there that you can uh, use at any point later for your analysis. So I'm not sure if you have a specific type of, of metadata or data that you would like to know about. No, I, I was asking in general, because whenever you upload the data, if like program is choosing that which data I should upload, and it's a little bit difficult because uh, sometimes I don't, I, I, I am also not sure that which data I should have uploaded. So that, that was, so, I mean, uh, whatever your answer is like perfectly fine. So, so uh, if you run through AIDA, I mean, AIDA automatically creates this provenance and connects all of your data in, inside the database, right? So then, then you would just, if you say you have a hundred calculations that are stored in a certain group, you can simply export this group and then you will get an AIDA archive file that you can then share. I, I'm not entirely sure about which extra metadata you have provided on the Fios Cloud. Um, and this you will see as you start the submission process. Um, but, but I think it, it, it should be quite all right if you run your calculations through AIDA. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for the questions and for the answer. Uh, we have another question which <clears throat> I think is very interesting. And uh, uh, so uh, it's about, because yesterday we spoke about HPC. So we introduced the uh, MPI, OpenMP, full parallelization, and uh, in general, um, H HPC clusters uh, and, and also GPU computing. So the question will, comes from one of the participants is, um, how, uh, how are we gonna see how to use that, uh, that uh, which is uh, HPC? together with uh, AIDA. So maybe could you spend a few comments about how AIDA works with the HPC facilities? Oh, definitely. Um, so for today's tutorial, um, I mean, to keep things a bit manageable, uh, we, we basically have just set up these, these cloud resources where you'll be running just on what's called the local host machine. So for today's tutorial, we won't be setting up a computer and a code for a remote machine yet. But of course there are tutorials for this. Um, on the AIDA documentation, you can find some how, how to's and how to do this. And so typically what you would do is you would, for a certain computer like the Marconi 100 cluster, you would set up this computer in AIDA. You would set up how to connect to this computer. And once all this is configured, you will specify certain codes that are defined on this computer, right? So you can imagine the PW code, uh, the HP code. These will all be defined on this computer that is stored in the AIDA database. And then you can start running the AIDA on this remote resource. And so the engine will automatically take care of um, moving your input files to the cluster, submitting it to the queuing system. Does we support Slurm, SGE, Torque, several uh, of, the, of the queuing systems are supported in AIDA. Then it will basically start checking, okay, uh, what status is it in? Is it, is it still queuing? Is it running? Uh, and when the calculation has, has been finished, the daemon of, of the engine will then retrieve the results automatically parse the outputs for in, 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 the, the, the type of outputs that you're interested in, the data that you're interested in, and then this will all be stored automatically in the database. So this today's, today's tutorial, we won't be seeing how to do this, but it's definitely online and documentation. And of course, if you run into any issues in setting up a computer or, or a code on a computer, you can definitely ask either, either on the Slack or, or, um, or just in either mailing list or, or, or on GitHub. Thank you, Marnik. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, there is another one. How about the space available in AIDA? Uh, from Cheva. The space? The yeah, space maybe, available? maybe Cheva, you could raise your hand so I can let you speak and uh, to explain a bit, a bit the question. Uh, okay, in the in the meanwhile, we have another question. Hello, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, the question was, was about uh, the space available in the mean in the sense that uh, the output uh, grows in, in volume in, in the mm -hmm. that necessary. 
uh, so how the free space or how we want to do we have to pay for space at that i don't know how the in the cloud oh, no so so no i mean or I um, okay if you're running aida lab in the cloud i mean that typically we wouldn't right now of course we're running things in the cloud just for the tutorial but the amount of space that's required here is quite limited but typically, if you were running AIDA, what you would do is actually install it on your own workstation or on a server that you have set up yourself. Um, and then, of course, everything will just be stored on your workstation. So you won't be running AIDA in the cloud in this instance. Typically, like for example, in my case, I have my workstation TPFL and I have a nice little uh, hard drive of two terabytes. And this will, for most calculations, and uh, be, be sufficient to store quite a bit of data. Because again, AIDA tries to, be, to store a lot of information, a lot of output and results but not massive files such as wave functions or chart sensitives. Okay, okay. Yes, so you know, my output, I upload them to the drive cloud because I have uh, a lot of space there. So can I link either with drive? So you mean store your um, output files or your, your repository directly on a cloud resource. Um, I, I'm not sure if you can do that. Maybe, maybe Chris knows, but I, I have never done this. But of course, even you can automatically link it to your cloud service. But mm -hmm. um, this I would not know how to answer. Maybe okay. is Chris still here? Yeah, I sorry. Uh, about this. Sorry, do you want to repeat <laughs> the last bit? I was... So basically, the question is, I mean, if, if he, he wants to store his data on a cloud resource, so is it possible to, to simply use automate that like let's say define your repository on a cloud resource if you're running from your workstation i don't think that's currently implemented um it's it's quite possible if you want to do it that way um okay. you can you can connect over the cloud um, there's nothing inherent in ada though to do that as such i mean you can you can set up your ada instance in the cloud and connect by the rest api um Oh, yeah, you could indeed. I mean, if, if you have a cloud resource where you want to run everything from, I guess you can also you just install AIDA on this cloud resource, right? Um, and then simply run from there. I guess that's not an op option. So if, if I may, uh, alternatively, what you can do uh, is uh, have Drive installed in your computer and assign a folder in your computer that is uh, shared with Drive that automatically syncs with Drive and then have uh, your repository of AIDA there. Uh, the, the yeah, that would be nice would be for the backing database. up the repository. The only problem would be the database. Uh, so uh, it's not a it's not a complete uh, uh, solution. You won't have all your data there, but you can have like the the most weighty, the most heavy parts, so to speak. So if your problem is space, uh, that can that can be a solution. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have time, Martin, for another question or? Of course, of course. Okay, so here. Hi, Marnik. Thank you for your talk. Um, I would like to know, in case we had a, like a local HPC resource to which we have unlimited access, could we run AIDA permanently on one core and submit jobs to that same cluster? So you don't have any kind of queuing system, you mean? Okay. Okay. You mean that, and that's a question. Do you have any kind of, so you mean a local resource which you have permanent access. So there's no kind of queuing system designed to, because you have to share this resource with others. Yes, yes. So there would be a queuing system, but the idea is that you can have one core for you permanently. So instead of running AIDA in your computer and submitting it to the cluster via SSH, you would just run AIDA on the cluster and submit to that same cluster. Um, well, you can, of course, install AIDA on, on, on the cluster itself, I think. There would be no problem with that, as far as I know. But then, of course, you would have to also install your repository and everything on, on this cluster, right? Um, this is maybe important also when, for example, you're having issues because of two-factor authentication. So I think yeah, that, that's done this. That's why I'm asking you. Yeah. No, exactly. I think indeed this is one of, one of the solutions for this problems with installing AIDA on the cluster and running everything there. Um, 
So I, I think this is this is there's certainly no problem as far as I can tell. Uh, maybe maybe Chris or Francisco know a problem that I am unaware of, but I think this is actually used already. Uh, so installing AIDA on your remote cluster. Okay, thank you. I'll check it out. I don't see other questions. Okay, well, if there are more questions later, of course, they can always ask during the tutorial as well, um, either in Zoom or on the Slack or just, you know, by raising their hand. Um, so I, I, I think it would be good that we can already get started then with the, the first part of the hands-on. Um, so the first, of course, order of business, making sure that everyone's connected to Jupyter Hub. I haven't checked the Slack now during my presentation, but I will do so shortly. So again, if anyone has any issues in connecting to the Jupyter Hub, um, let me know. And I can try to fix it as soon as possible. Um, and if, if so for now, I think I will simply stop sharing my screen and then hand the word to Francisco, my colleague, who will be um, presenting the first part of the hands-on.